Right, I think we originally had a bit of a working title on this session, so that that was the the new oil, and that's kind of like okay, now what? This is me. Um, I've been a data architect for up to years, started when I was twelve. Um, <laughs> I've been before that in business operations. I've done IT support. I've, very proud of the fact that I was able to build a, um, a European data warehouse incorporating data from 19 different locations, two different business clients. Um, I'm a CDMP, uh, which surprised me as much as anybody else, to be honest. But, um, because I've gained so much from my Dharma membership over the years in terms of support. I actually stood for office and president of Dharma UK uh, chapter at the moment and vice president for marketing and communications for Dharma International, my team. So the beach balls, I have to confess, were my idea. But I've seen that you sleep, then we'll come to your way. If you want to tweet, tweet me, it's Lady Avery. Right, who has heard this? We've got all of this stuff going on, and I've actually moved jobs within my organisation into a marketing sales job, and I've heard this. We've got all this stuff. I can find out all about my customer. I can market to them. It's going to be great, and it's going to be so easy, and it's going to be marvellous, and we're just going to check it in, and it's all going to be amazing. Who's like that? Button. <laughs> yeah, okay. Excellent. I've been practicing that, I quite like that. <laughs> so, we don't need data people anymore. We've got all these tools, all these technologies, and we're going to go behind this. How are we going to say that? Hi, hi. I'm not going to say that this looks like some of my colleagues at all. I couldn't possibly. <laughs> I don't know, I recognise one of them. <laughs> So, and we're going to get all these little nuggets, and we're going to get, oh, 42, right, okay, which we all know, I think everybody in here knows that 42 is the answer to life, the universe, and everything, but if you're trying to market to somebody, and you've got 42, how does that actually help you? But, does it actually make sense? in this instance. We don't need data people to help us with it. Remember, marketers don't need data people. But then they look at stuff and they think, well, I know I've only sold 45,000, but I've got all these orders, all this feedback, and you scratching your head. This data is the new oil. I think we all know that oil, before it becomes really, really valuable, we actually need to refine it. This may well be a, a, um, a route, it's a route I'm trying to use at the moment. So, saying, okay, oil needs refining. What about if our data does too? You can't just take a great big pile or a great big lake or a great big, what's it coming? Barrels, buckets, whatever, of food oil, and then immediately use it to drive the car. <coughs> so, sadly, you know, we have to apply a little bit of logic. Logic being the beginning of wisdom. I love Mr. Spock. You just know it. I know. So, <laughs> you don't need data people. Thank you. I actually did wear my Spock t shirt the day after at the gaming convention I was at. I am that much of a geek. So, now, this is where Lauren gave us a really good example of a great way to do it. Rather than starting with this huge pile of stuff and thinking, it's going to make me millions, we really need to have a little bit of an idea of what it is we actually want to know. You know, what do I want to know about this? In TFL's example, it was journeys, journey times. As a marketeer, it's one of the sort of things that people are thinking about us is sentiment index that you hear. So what do people think about us? 
on what are they thinking of doing? Am I, have I got something that's actually triggering or can I determine a set of events that trigger a buying action? Now, I work for a uh, large international motor, man motor manufacturer and one of our key metrics is the build and price count of people that have gone onto the website to do a user configuration tool and build and then price a vehicle. Logic being that this is the people are going on build and price and yeah they're going to buy or there's a good chance that they'll buy. Until you see the amount of times that a Mustang has been built and priced. <laughs> But basically, because it's just really cool, cool to go on there and say, I want a pink Mustang, and I want to have this, I want to have that. So, but you can, if you take out some of this um, statistical, what do they call it, extreme stuff, you do sensible stuff. <laughs> so then what logically is my raw material? with it. What have I got? I've got stuff coming through from Twitter, I've got this sentiment. I've got my web click stream stuff, this is all coming through. But I need to think about this to help me drive the questions about what is it, not to the precise end degree, but what in the region of it do I want to know? Not what colour socks is the guy that was doing the building price wearing, but it needs to be something don't tell anybody, shh, because we don't need data people anymore. But we are doing logical and conceptual modeling of this. Provided we don't tell people, this, but this is what we actually need to do. So we can use this, we can produce pictures and say, look, this one is called the scope. You wish to do this investigation and it helps us with the framework, it helps us put the images on. But we're not data modeling. Step two. What data is actually coming in? Back to our big piles of Twitter feeds and you know web stuff. But then there's basic stuff as well. Existing customers that have logged on to our website. They've maybe in, in my instance they've um, you can log on to the Ford site and register yourself for My Ford, so you can get um, you can get information about your vehicle and all the rest of it, so like the marketing, which is great. And I thought, well, I'll do that. I'll test this out. Went on. It said, put your VIN in, and I'm sitting at my desk in the office of my car. Is my car and I'm put your VIN. Really, really, Ford. Put your VIN in. Sorry, don't know that. And have I got everything? So how many times have I got the same stuff and have I got everything? So by doing this previous sort of I figured it out, it shouldn't have that one. Sorry, don't <laughs> So if by doing your conceptual, your logically type model, your scope, you can see where you've got gaps. And it should, if you approach it with an open mind lead people into asking about, oh, but what if? And it, it's sort of the mind mapping stuff. Have I got everything? Don't tell anybody. But we are actually looking at data flows and mapping this time. Which gives us this baseline verification when we're trying to sell it to people. So we can go to the people that are our marketeers and say, look, we've got something that will help you verify what you've got, and it will also help us drive towards a confidence index in the value of this data. Actually, it was a question I meant to ask Lauren. I don't know if, if you do have such a thing as a confidence index in your, your data at all. That's my sort of, what I would call it. I would say it's sort of, it's mixed. I mean, certainly we, in terms of formal tool and profiling, still sort of early days. I think, sort of, but in terms of confidence in it, it's probably honestly more we understand where the high points are. Where, and on revenue, of course, it's very strong, but we know where there are gaps. Okay, good. But you're doing sorry, just a minute, sorry, you're doing a, a a good job about actually 
knowing what it is you want to achieve and then understanding your data to come in. So that leads to that question. Sorry, there was a question? No, it's not anything to do with the quality of the data, the data quality of the checks. Funny you should say that. <laughs> is my source data okay? <laughs> no, I'm not no. on the wire. <laughs> Don't move, please. Is it crude and is it dirty? So this goes to the quality of data. We may then want to do um, a little bit of looking at the content we actually have. Checking is it clean? Do we need to clean it up? Do we need to de it? Do we need to refine it? So, again, don't tell anybody, but we're doing the profiling and cleansing. So we're still doing our traditional, if such a thing exists in our uh, profession, data, data jobs, but in this whole new world of we don't need data people. So it's, we all, um, it's not telling you anything you don't know, we all know that once we understand our data, we can profile it. We can build in this confidence in less, so we can say with a degree of certainty. To use this sort of build and price metric, oh my gosh, we've got 500,000 know, 500, build, and, build and price activities, we're going to sell loads of cars. How many of those are for Mustangs? And it makes your insights much more supportable. I found this, I really like this, and it, it's one I'm going to actually stick on my wall. But it actually does take discipline, and this is what we as data people, data modelers, are good at, is this sort of discipline that will allow us to support turning some of our marketeers' illusions and I've, I've honestly heard some of those words because I've been moved into a sales and marketing job, which I think, I don't know what I did wrong in the past life, but Jesus Christ. <coughs> but it does turn this kind of illusion into reality. So maybe what we are now is refinery workers. So we can still do what we go at, we can still contribute, we can still make a difference. We just might have to sell ourselves a little differently than what we're doing. Still doing the same stuff. Okay. That was quite quick because I know I only had, well, I'll through it very quickly, sort of 15, 20 minutes. But uh, there's time for sort of feedback and questions. Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned discipline, and yes. that was my train of thought actually, because you talked about these things that I know I keep under the covers as well, logical, conceptual models, flows, and, and in my environment discipline means I have to set up a structure for keeping those, and in the ideal world I have a tool set. So I just wondered, are you using self-imposed discipline to record those things and drawing them effectively, or do you have a more sophisticated tool set to do all those things? In my particular department, it's my only self-discipline. However, there are um, other departments, but they're, they're in the States. Mm -hmm. And they use a tool set called ProVision. Anybody using that? OK, I've got a couple of nods. I've seen it. it, it I've just seen it from a consuming some of its output. And it does this incredible variety of incredibly complex models of all sorts of things. Motivational models and data models and flows and you know all sorts of stuff. That when I look at them as a data person, I think, no. And it personally I find it I switch off. But I think what that might be a symptom of is trying to pile too much into one picture rather than that the tool set is no good. It looks as though it could be useful, I think. The gentleman behind you is not <coughs> using that as well. So it could be useful. But where I am now, because I'm having to start, I've moved from a data architect job to a business process management job. And please don't, my boss says, well, I don't need <coughs> my data stuff anymore because I'm in business process now. <coughs> 
This is a new thing, um, so the education is ongoing, but the forehead is still flat at the moment. So what, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm doing it without telling you what I'm doing and then I'm pointing So maybe if I could just ask a supplementary, that that was one of my other thoughts about process. Because the way we position the data work is that the process tells you what the business does, and then that provides the context, which is something I find really important for the data, and we model the data within the context of processes. And I wondered whether, when you said you look at a conceptual model and see whether it's complete, that for me, if I've covered all the processes and I've fed back into the processes from the data, you're not, that's, that's why I know it's yeah. complete. Yeah. Okay. Totally agree with you. I think if we can't, you can't be a data person or a process person with, with this. Some of us have more of a, a, a lean one way than the other. But it is very much the strongest team. I keep drawing this sort of three circle Venn diagram is that is your business process person, or your analyst or whatever, your data person, then maybe enterprise architecture as well. And that sweet spot is one in the middle. But I, com I completely agree with you. Besides, it's much more fun working with a partner, and that's when you get, you get to start from going on and you spot more ideas. I wonder if your experience is showing the mistake that maybe we're making in general as data people, which is that we're offering people good data and clean data and data flows and whatever, and the business doesn't actually want that. What they want to do is sell more cars or sell more equipment or whatever. And so almost if we say, we have a way so you can sell more cars, and by the way, there's some magic beans that we do behind the scenes, which we call our data management methodology. That's great, but as you said, we, we don't need to tell them about that. Just show them we know how to get and sell more cars. Exactly, it's pretty much echoing what Sue was, was sharing with us as well, which is, okay, this is what you want. Wow, ah, it's really cool. Oh, it's still the same data, but yes, totally agree. So we have found as we, over the past few years with, with Dharma, the ongoing claim, uh, you know, complaint has been, but my business doesn't understand me. All right, get it. We have to be effective in our communication to adapt and find all those different ways to, um, to get the points over. I don't have this um, You mentioned the confidence, uh, confidence index or uh, I use a confidence score. Do you find that at data set level, record level or attitude level? Um, good question. I think in the, I'm going to give you the standard really irritating answer, which is it depends um, on what you've got coming in and, and really what you can make out of it. You can look at something and think, if you've got a set of customer data from a, a central reference database, which of course we all know we've got, that you should have a high confidence on that index. Maybe on some of the fields in a, in a web click, if they're at the beginning, before it goes all over the place, possibly. So it depends what you're looking at, but it's just been that, I think. Um, introducing the concept to a confidence index, call it what you like, I think, is, is a good one, because it can bring, make, make people think, as opposed to, think, oh, we've had all these building a price. Yes, sir. Do some work on uh, open addresses, which you know, some of you may have heard of. Where we've actually calculated, uh, I've worked on a confidence scoring algorithm, which uses a comp uh, combination of reference tables and statistics. So, looking at what has been supplied to date and, and its uh, the distribution of that data. So, so, it's quite an area of interest, particularly for user supplied. So we're really looking at where people are supplying addresses via the web, what confidence score can we apply to the attributes that they've got, so that's why I'm interested in that topic. Okay. Well, I could probably chip in on this. So some of the work I'm doing is with Network Rail, who have to report to the Office of Rail, or Rail and Roads, that now is confidence level about their data. And they actually went into a real mess at one point, because they were trying to do confidence grading at individual record level, where it has no meaning. Oh, but if you're looking at data set level, or at a particular attribute or groups of attributes, it starts to have some meaning. But if you go too granular, you actually start losing meaning, you start getting confused with straight data or metrics. But that's where the process context is important, because if you were looking at data that was about the administration, radiation, for example, to cancer patients, you 
do you think you'd want to get close to 100 percent point? Yes. If you were doing marketing, it's got a bunch of prospects, then 100 percent point they do. So that's where the context comes in. And, uh, and, uh, and that's why it's so good. Yeah, that context thing is interesting. Tell you a story about sort of this big data at work. I, a few years ago now, split up with my partner and we were both on Facebook. We were sat next to each other on Facebook and we hit single at exactly the same time. Immediately. Not an eye blink. Not an anosicle in between an anosicle. I got an advert for mature, reliable men. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, please, really, face it. Sure and reliable. If you thought just thought I said men, that's your problem. <laughs> Anyone? Any more questions? Yeah, I actually have a question. You mentioned big data. Now, there is a thought sort of process going on that. Where we're really talking about big data, as in actual fact, billions and billions and billions of records, our quality isn't necessarily as important as it is when you're talking about, for example, master data, which would be customer name, address, and, and those kinds of sort of less sort of um, transient pieces of information. Do you have a, a thought on whether that opinion? is valid, that sort of let's not worry too much about data sort of quality, because we have so much data that um, we can make assumptions on that data and the quality is going to be less useful. Yes, I agree. Did everybody hear Sue on that? Yeah. Maybe? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do, I do agree with that totally, and I think this goes back to the confidence index. It would build in something that says, are we 100% sure that this is right? Or how sure are we that this is right? And then how much does it actually matter? So the kind of the six sigma thing where you you score it on you know actual definite quality and then relevance really and you do get this this because that much a lot of it is gonna just float off and bit and be lost in the round thing. But you do get these incidents like the Everybody's playing with the Mustang configurator on the portside because it's a cool thing to do. But is it a real buying indicator for an example? How does sales of pink Mustang? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're still working on bringing them in, but they're, they're, there's not that many. They should be cool. They keep putting them in the, um, in the lobby, in uh, actually just. Typically, so you get to go and draw with them, but not actually driving here. Right, um, following on with Sue's question about um, confidence ratings and things like that, how do you get a message across to marketing people that actually the data you're playing with in the, in the data lake or coming out of the oil, data oil wells, or whatever you, whichever data you really want to use, how do you persuade them to get a message across that actually you can't really rely on this data too much? or but it's a bit flaky in this way, so that we have to take into account when you interpret the results of what you see. Okay, a very good friend of mine, who's not a million miles away from me at the moment, once described the one of the main attributes of a good data person is to ask the awkward question. Okay. So, if you're looking at that, and you need to persuade, you can have a look at the data if you can, and then just say, well. Are we really going to sell 500,000 Mustangs in this instance? You know, how do we know? How do we know this is accurate? Does it look realistic? Instead of all getting excited, we're going to sell, and then we can't build that many before we rush off and buy them. Really? Yes. So, so, it, so, so, so it's case case case, case of sense checking the result rather than reporting out uh, specific attributes of data or data quality. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say previously about saying, do you do, do, you do that confidence of the attribute level data set level or set level uh, source data? Yeah, ask the awkward question. Okay. You know, have a look at it and think that this, this sort of common sense thing. Yeah. It's not an idea, common sense. Yeah. But yeah. Well, it's a common sense. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
trust right. so if you become the person that is trusted yeah. when you're when the data is iffy you right. say to them look in this instance your data is iffy right. and if, if you've created that level of trust with the with the with your marketers mm -hmm. they'll believe you it's when they don't believe it that they want to go well we'll go with this rubbish data because we don't think it's rubbish but you, you need to get to the stage where they they're trusting you so much that when you say to them whoa the, the data is rubbish they go okay well now what Thank you, but we can talk more, and there's the opportunity this afternoon at the panel as well. So, thank you. Bye.